Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. God bless you. We thank the Lord for giving us another chance again to have our leadership development session. And I pray that the Lord will touch everyone, strengthen everyone, and make us the leaders we ought to be. That this work will prosper in our hands together in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you at this time and bless your name. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for your servants, our brothers, our sisters, our fathers in the Lord, our mothers in the Lord, our overseers, everyone. We're asking, O oh Lord, as you have kept us all these years to be faithful, defending the truth, and propagating the truth, we pray that your strength and your power will continue in everyone's life in Jesus' name. You have promised to bless the faithful. That as we sow, we're going to reap as well. And I pray that none of us will miss our rewards here on earth and even in eternity as well in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. Teach your people today and send us forth with purposeful action to keep on sowing and keep on reaping and keep on sowing and keep on reaping until our life will be full of rewardable service in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you've done it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we are looking at the word of God on sowing and reaping. And uh, I'm reading from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and we're looking at verse 35. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and we're looking at verse 35. Here are the words of Jesus Christ that Paul, the Apostle, brought again to the form. That is, he brought it uh, to the front line that we will consider, that we will understand that Jesus Christ has said this. And we need to take this word of God and the word of Christ seriously. He said, I have showed you how that in all things that you will, um, that you also labor in supporting the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. What are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. You see, there are two words there. One word is to give. The other one is to receive. There are many people that only think of receiving and receiving and receiving. And yet, we need to understand that as Jesus has said it, and as Paul the Apostle has reminded us that this is what Jesus said, we give and then we receive. We receive then we keep on giving. And actually it is more blessed, it is more profitable, and it is more exciting to give than to receive. Today I'm talking about this law of sowing and reaping. And the title of the message is Remembering the Law, the Unchangeable Law of Prosperity. Remembering and so acting on it, the unchangeable law of prosperity. As we talk about uh, this prosperity, I want you to expand your mind and expand your understanding concerning prosperity. Number one, the spiritual prosperity. That you as a child of God, you as a minister of God, you want to be prospered spiritually. Isn't that what John the Beloved said? I wish above all things that you prosper, your soul will prosper, and that you will prosper materially, even as your soul is prospering, and that you'll be in health as well. Number one, the spiritual prosperity. Number two, there is material prosperity. That in the profession of your hand, in the work of your hand, that materially, as you follow the laws of prosperity, in the word of God, that he will give you material prosperity. I'm sure you understand too that as we minister, as we preach the word of God, as we touch the lives of people, influence people one way or the other, there is another kind of prosperity, ministerial prosperity, that everybody can see. 
that the work you are doing is prospering. The preaching you are giving is prospering. The prayers you are praying is prospering. And the thoughts you have in the lives of people, you are prospering. Number one, there is a spiritual prosperity. Number two, there is material prosperity. Number three, there is ministerial prosperity. I but in our families, filial prosperity, family prosperity, that husband and wife, the way you give to each other, and the way you have affection for each other, and the way you recognize the need of each other, and you meet those needs of each other, you're going to have a good family, a happy family, a joyful family, a reproductive family, and there is family prosperity. I believe there's also social prosperity. You see among our neighbors as we relate together properly. And they see that we're always giving. We're giving, uh, you know, uh, words of uh, greeting. And we're giving words of advice. And we're giving even the material needs that they may have. And we're trying to meet their needs. You see, there is also social prosperity. There is influential prosperity. You see, there are people that uh, you have a lot of things, but they're not influential. But there is a kind of prosperity that makes you in, in, in influential in society. And so there is influential prosperity. What I also say, there's progressive prosperity. You are prospered now, and you keep on giving, and you receive. And as you receive more, you give more. And as you receive more, you give more. And you are progressing. You are not like, uh, it's like you prospered last year. You are still at the same level. You are going higher and higher. And you are doing greater things. And the material things you have, they are being of benefit for me, to many, many people. There is progressive prosperity. And then there is reproductive prosperity. What do I mean by that? You reproduce others. And as they look at your life, and they see that this is the law of prosperity you are following. And they too, they follow that kind of a law. They are able to prosper. So you are producing other people who love the Lord, who know the Lord, and who are giving to other people. And as you are prospering, you are reproducing disciples and reproducing children of God who too are prospering. In Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 7. In this verse, the Lord is telling us, He says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He's telling us that the law of sowing and reaping and the law of prosperity did not end at the time of uh, the farmers in the Old Testament or at the time of the sowers in the New Testament. That law still continues. And he says, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatsoever. A man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now you see the word of God, the New Testament now, is broadening it. It's going beyond the seed we sow on the farm. It's talking about our moral life now, our character now. It's talking about the influence we have on other people. And it says, whatsoever we sow. Everyone, whatsoever, a man, a woman, a young person, an elderly person, whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. In fact, if you go to the next verse, that is in verse 8, you see, it says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that sows to the flesh is talking about our character, the fruit of the spirit, or the works of the flesh. If we sow to the flesh, we're producing the works of the flesh. And it says we're going to reap corruption. What's that saying? If we sow a bad seed, we reap bad habits. If we sow corrupt life, we're going to reap a corrupt result. Whatever we sow, that is what we reap. It says, for whosoever, for he that soweth to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But look at this, this is the better part, and I believe this is your part. And you will sow to the Spirit. You will sow spiritually. And you will sow in a way that life will become better for you, ministry will become exciting for you, and your spiritual impact in the lives of people around you will be wonderful. 
remove that point. It says, but he that sows to the spirit. You are sowing spiritual things. The word of God. You are preaching the gospel. You are sowing to the lives of people. As you do that, it says, he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. Can I show you something there? It's talking about sowing and sowing and sowing. He that soweth. I sowed uh, last year. I must sow this year too. I sowed into the lives of people. I came across it last time. I must keep on sowing. He that soweth, he that soweth, he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. As I said, we're talking about remembering the unchangeable law of prosperity. Remember it. Walk on it. Act like that and so into the lives of people. We're looking at it under three perspectives. Number one, remember the law of sowing and reaping. Remember the law of sowing and reaping. Just like you remember every time the law of gravity. You throw something up, it must come down. That's why you are careful when you're on the first floor. Uh, you don't want to take any step that will make you fall because you always remember in your subconscious the law of gravity. The same way you should also remember every time the law of sowing and reaping. Number one, then remember the law of sowing and reaping. Number two, renew your love for souls to rescue. Renew your love for souls. Which kind of souls? The souls you are to rescue. The souls you are to deliver. The souls that are to be saved. The souls you are to bring out of darkness and bring them to the light. The souls that are waiting for you. That you will draw them up from the pit of despondency and draw them to the mountain top of the light of achievement and excitement and joy and life eternal. Number two, renew your love for souls to rescue. Number three, regain the life of sacrificing without relenting. Sacrificing without relenting. You sow now sacrificially and then you are not stopping. There is no retardation and there is no stopping. You, know? you keep on sowing, you keep on sowing, you keep on sowing. You know? And you want to regain that kind of life. The life of sacrificing you know, without relenting. Let's come to number one. Number one, I'm reading from Genesis chapter 26. Genesis chapter 26, this is to remember the law of Suina and Riffin. This law had been there for a long time and the law is still operational, functional and effective today. Genesis chapter 26, let's look at verse 12. In Genesis chapter 26, uh, verse 12, uh, we see what the word of God is saying. It's talking about Isaac. You remember the promise the Lord had given to Abraham. And then it passed on to Isaac. And then it passed on to Jacob. It passed on to the twelve tribes of Israel. It passed on to the nation of Israel. It passes on now to the church of God. It says, then Isaac sowed in the land. In the land where he sojourned. In the land where the Lord has told him, stay here. If you read verses 1 to 3, you'll see there. The Lord said, don't go any other place. Stay here. And in that land that the Lord had given him to sojourn, Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. He received in that year an hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. That's how the Lord is going to bless you when you sow. Because the law of sowing and reaping still continues today. It tells us in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 4. It's telling us that there isn't any time that we should say, well, I'm not saying now because of this uh, situation, because of this uh, pandemic, and because of this difficulty, and because of the period in which we're living. Now. Look at this. He that observes the wind shall not sow. And if we don't sow, how do we reap? And he that observes the wind, things are difficult, times are hard, the road is rough, the mountain is high, everybody has a own body, and at this time of a difficulty, disease, and a spreading everywhere, what can I do? 
if we observe the wind, we will not sow. He's saying, don't think about anything around you. The law of sowing and reaping will work anytime. I must keep on walking every time. So, he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regarded the cloud shall not reap. You see, after we have sown, we ought to reap. And if we're looking at the cloud, at the wind, at the storm, at the difficulties, at the dangers, at the predicaments, at what everybody is talking about, we will not sow and we will not reap. That's why he tells us in verse 6, that is Ecclesiastes chapter 11, reading verse 6 here, it says that in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. It says, we keep on sowing. It says, morning, keep on sowing. Afternoon, keep on sowing. At every opportunity, keep on sowing. It says, for thou knowest not whether I shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good, alike uh, prosper. So then, the encouragement is that we need to keep on sowing, and we need to keep on planting, and we need to keep on doing everything we do. You understand uh, when he talks about sowing. In fact, it comes to the New Testament and tells us now in particular about the sowing. In 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, I'm reading here from verse 6. Here is uh, the Holy Ghost talking through Paul the Apostle. It says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. It's talking about uh, the principle and the law of sowing and reaping. And he's saying, we can sow scantily. We can sow sparingly. We can sow reluctantly. We can sow and not cover the whole field. And just sow a little here, a little here, and then go back home. He says, if we do that, we sow uh, sparingly, we sow scantily, we shall reap also scantily. But he says, he which soweth bountifully, he who breaks all the seed and he wants to cover all the land. He wants to cover every area and he brings the seed and he sows in this district and he sows in that district and he sows in that district and he sows in that project and he sows into that work and he sows into that service. It's just for sowing, just for sowing. And he sows bountifully. He sows abundantly. He shall also reap bountifully. That's the encouragement the Lord is giving us now. Now, when he talks about he that sows sparingly and he that sows bountifully, what was he really talking about? Look at verse 7. In verse 7, look at what he says there every man according as he purposes in his heart. So let him give. Ah, uh, ah, uh, you see, he's talking about giving, he's talking about material things, material resources, the resources you have. The money you have, the material things you have. When he says, he that sows sparingly, that means he that gives just a little. Just to say, uh, not to say, I didn't give. He that does that, he also will, will reap sparingly. He says, every man, according as the purpose says, it is that. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, as if somebody is dragging us, as if somebody is pushing us, as if somebody is saying, okay, they've made the announcement again, they've shown it on the screen again, okay, we ought to give. Don't do that. Don't give grudgingly. I'm sure you are not giving grudgingly. You know, I'm just preaching to everybody, but I know you in particular. I know your life, and I know that, you know, with earnestness and with joy, you're doing what you're doing, but he's saying that none of us should give grudgingly, and none of us should give of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. For God loveth a cheerful giver. And I pray that as you hear all this, you will revive your giving again. The giving of your tithes and offering, the giving of uh, your, your resources, and the giving of what you have. Remember, he that giveth cheerfully and giveth 
lovingly and giveth wisely and giveth abundantly from the death of his heart is going to receive an abundance. An abundance will come into your life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 8. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8. And look at what he's saying there. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you as you give bountifully. As you give cheerfully, as you give lovingly, as you give abundantly, as you give with all with the joy of service, and you are really giving to the Lord, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, you in particular, I'm talking to you now, the Lord is talking to you now, the Spirit of the Lord is talking to you, and is saying that this is you, that you, Always having, think about that, underline that in your Bible, always having, you know, all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Uh, there, there's something that is um, kind of uh, uh, turning around here. It's saying, you, know, you give, you give cheerfully, you give abundantly. You give all the resources you have, and then God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that now you will have all things, and you will have all sufficiency, and that makes you to keep on giving again, that you may abound to every good work. And look at, um, we're looking at um, Proverbs chapter 3, and reading from verses 9 and 10. Proverbs chapter 3, and we're reading from verses 9 and 10. From verse 9, honor the Lord with thy substance. Honor the Lord with thy substance. See, the commandment there is telling us that we're sowing to the field of God. We're sowing into the kingdom of God. And it says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. It's still talking about sowing what we have, we sow. What we possess, we sow. What we have earned, we sow. And as a result of that sowing, as a result of honoring the Lord with the very first fruits, look at what a blessing we're going to have, the result we're going to have in verse 10. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. Uh, what, what is that saying? It's the language of sowing and reaping. You have sown, you have given of your first fruits, and it says, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. I want to say amen for you there. Amen. And God is going to prosper you. And God is going to reward you. Actually, uh, the people of all the people of God, the patriarchs and the prophets and the people of the Old Testament, they knew this. They knew this. Even before the law of Moses. Look at Genesis chapter 28. In Genesis chapter 28, reading from verse 20. Genesis chapter 28, reading from verse 20. You will see what Jacob said unto the Lord. And in fact, it's not just that he said it. He made it a vow. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me, and God will be with you. The Lord has said, I'll never leave you, and I'll never forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I shall not fear what men or situations or pandemic shall do in the world. It says, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, the Lord said he will keep you, and the Lord is going to keep you. And then Jacob said, if he will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on. Look at what he now said in verse 21. In verse 21, he said, So that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. The Lord is your God. I said the Lord is your God. Is your Savior. Is your sanctifier. It's your baptizer in the Holy Ghost. It's your supplier. It's your healer. It's your redeemer. It's your all in all. And it's the one that is preparing a place for you. And you are going to get there to heaven in Jesus' name. And now in verse 22, here is the vow. Here is the promise. And this stone, which I have said for a pillar, shall be God's house. He said, I'm going to build God an habitation. I'm going to use my resources. I'm not going to uh, just uh, hold everything and keep everything to myself. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely, 
underline the word surely. I will surely, I will definitely give the test unto thee. Give the test unto is from that, even from the, before the law. You know, there are people that say tithes and offering is only the law of Moses. Not at all, not at all. Moses was not born at this time of Genesis chapter 28. Moses had not given the law. God had not given the law to Moses at this time in the Genesis. Yet the people of God, from Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob, they knew about the sowing and reaping and giving and receiving and paying tithes and offering and being blessed of the Lord. Look at it now in Malachi, the last I have shown you from the first book of the Bible. We're now coming to the last book of the Bible, which is Malachi chapter 3. And in Malachi chapter 3, it tells us in verse 10, Malachi chapter 3, it tells us in verse 10, it said, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. It's saying, don't, don't take away from that tithe. It's the tenth of your income. It's the tenth of your profit. It's the tenth of your material things, of your money. And it says regularly, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, here we, says the Lord, if I will not open the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, you know, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It says, bring the tithe, all the tithe, bring everything, and I will so bless you, that you will not even be able to receive all that I will bless you with. It tells us in verse 11, Look at verse 11. It says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sins. Everything that they tries to devour you, everything that they tries to uh, devour, your, devour your crop or your work, and the loss of job at this time when the threat is there that many people may be losing their job, the Lord said, I'll be on your side. I'll be on your side. I will protect that job for you. I will protect the source of your income. He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast a um, cast a fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And verse 12 is wonderful. Look at verse 12. And look at what he says you are going to have. And all nations shall call you blessed. I'm looking at you over there and I'm saying that the blessing of God will be upon your life. I'm saying that the prosperity of the Lord will be upon your life. And it says, all nations shall call you blessed. And ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. That promise will be fulfilled in your life in Jesus' name. What's the implication of all that? The implication is, look at Psalm 96. Psalm 96, I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 96, reading from uh, verse 7. 96, verse 7 in the Psalms. And here the Lord is telling us what we ought to have, what we ought to do, and how the blessing of God will come upon our lives. Psalm 96, we're reading from verse 7. It says in verse 7, Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, and give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Then it says in verse 8, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Look at this now. Bring an offering. Bring an offering. Bring an offering and come into his cause. It says, O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, fear before him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth, the world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He, he shall judge the people 
righteously. Uh, that's what the blessing of the Lord is talking about. But you remember in that uh, verse 8, it says, bring an offering, bring an offering, and worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We we'll bring the offering as we we'll worship the Lord. You say, but how about this time of uh, lockdown, you can still do it too. At the time of worship, when the time of offering uh, comes, everything the Lord has uh, laid on your heart to bring part of your tithes and, and offering. Uh, you raise that up to you and then we we'll pray and you lay it aside. And when there's a chance to take it to the bank, you take it to the bank. I'm looking at First Corinthians chapter 16 uh, and we're reading from verse 2. First Corinthians chapter 16, uh, reading from verse 2. Here is what the Lord has uh, commanded and here is what the children of God are still doing upon the first day of the week. Let every one of you, you understand that? Every one of you, you're a worker, every one of you, you're a leader, every one of you, you're a pastor, every one of you, you're a servant of God, every one of you, you are uh, a salary earner, every one of you, you're a self-employed person, every one of you says upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store. As God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. Uh, but if, what if I don't have much? Well, out of the little you have, you still honor God. Let me show you an example that Jesus Christ himself highlighted in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 1. In Luke chapter 21, verse 1, it says, And he looked up. And he saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasure. Isn't it wonderful that these rich men could come to the house of God, to the sanctuary of the Lord, and then as the time of offering came, they knew the Lord had prospered them. They knew that everything they had was of the Lord. And therefore, as Jesus looked at them, they offered what they had. And it says that the rich men cast their gifts into the treasury. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, and Jesus saw, and he saw also a certain poor widow, and casting in is two mites. And then in verse 3, here is the comment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, Of the truth I say unto you, that this poor widow has cast him more than they all. This poor widow has cast him more than they all. In verse 4, he tells us the reason why he said that in verse 4. For all these rich men, all these uh, people that had very much, they have cast in of their abundance into the offering of God, offerings of God, not offering for man, offerings of God. Jesus called each offerings of God, but she of her penury, she of her poverty, has cast in all the living that she had. You know what the Lord is telling us today? He's saying, we should remember the law of sowing and reaping. And as we sow, where we reap. As you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. As you sow uh, cheerfully, you reap cheerfully. As you sow with all your heart, because you are interested in the progress of the kingdom of God, of the work of God, and of everything, the ministry of the word of God into the lives of people. That's why you are sowing, and the Lord is going to bless you as you reap in Jesus' name. We we'll come to point number two now. In point number two is to renew your love for souls to rescue. That's still part of Suina. Part of Suina, you renew your love uh, for uh, souls to rescue. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 27. Exodus chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 27. Now, the Lord had called Moses, and Moses was going to come from a long distance where he had gone uh, in, uh, the, by the backside of Midian 
and uh, he knew not many people now to see all the elders and to see all the people in the land of Egypt. But Aaron had been there all the time. Look at what happened here. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and he met him in the mouth of God and kissed him. They had been apart for 40 years. He had not seen him for 40 years because Moses had been away. But now he was to bring Moses to the people, introduce him to the people, so that everything the Lord wanted Moses to tell the people of Israel, he'll tell Aaron, Aaron will tell them. How important that would do like Aaron. There might be a Moses somewhere. There may be a servant of God somewhere. We have lost contact. He himself has lost contact. There is a desire in his heart that he will get to the people of God again, reunite with the people of God again. As the Lord said to Aaron, the Lord is saying to you, why don't you go seek them out, search them out, and bring them. If you read the whole story, that's exactly what happened. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 36. Daniel chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 36. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 36, uh, this is Nebuchadnezzar talking now. This is Nebuchadnezzar giving testimony of what really happened. You know the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He had been away because, uh, you know, he had mental challenge. And he became like an animal. Was eating grass like an animal. But his throne was there. His kingdom was there. He had forgotten all about that. Are there not people like that? Something happened to them, and we don't know why they should be like that. They are forsaking the work of the Lord. Uh, um, let's just read this together. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 36, And at the same time, my reason returns unto me, and uh, for, the, uh, for the life, for the glory of my kingdom. And it says, my honor, and brightness also returns unto me, and my counselors, and my Lord sought unto me. They sought for him. Well, time is going, and this uh, Nebuchadnezzar, our king, our emperor, we have not seen him now for some time because of the challenge he had, and now the Lord saw the challenge. Everything now came back, and the lords and the counselors and the people sought him, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. We can do that too. We can reach out to people too. The people, we know they are not where they ought to be. It's not every time we're only seeking only sinners. Yes, of course, we seek sinners. We seek backsliders. We seek other people who had, had problems. And because of the problems that had, they have been away from where they ought to be. In love, we shall search for them. In love, we shall seek them. We're told in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, we're reading from verse 8. Here is the illustration Jesus gave concerning the woman that had lost or is missed, has missed or something. And Jesus applied that spiritually. It's still sowing and reaping. We're sowing our time. We're giving our time. We're giving our attention. We're giving our energy to seeking people and bringing them, sowing the seed of the word of God in their hearts. It says either what woman having a ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. She has lost uh, a piece of coin and then she lights the candle and she sweeps the house and she keeps on seeking diligently. And that's what we do. We want to renew our love for souls who are lost, for souls who are no more in the kingdom. Well, when you look at uh, ten pieces and somebody lost only one and ten still and nine still remaining, I've got ninety percent. And there are some people they not worry about the ten percent that is lost, but we sow our time. 
and we sow our energy, we sow our wisdom, everything with God, so that we can run after the one that is lost. And when we're seeking them, underline the watch in that verse eight, diligently, diligently. She was seeking diligently, and then the word till, until, until, until she finds that. And then we're told in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, and when she has found it. When she has found it, before finding it, all her attention was on that lost coin. Before finding it, all, our, all her intelligence and all her methods and everything she could do was on that lost coin. But now, when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace that I had lost. Look at the conclusion in verse 10. As Jesus spoke to the people, he said, Likewise, in the same way I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of God. Think about that. In the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. There is joy because you seek after that sinner and you sow your knowledge, you sow the seed of the gospel, you sow the seed of the word, and you sow everything diligently into that person's life until it begins to take root, until it begins to take effect, and the people come back and they repent and return unto the Lord. It says there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over that one sinner that repented. How many of us leaders are there tonight and we're connected and we're hearing this word of God about sowing and reaping? If I will do that and think about somebody I've not found for a long time. I've not taught for a long time. I've not seen for a long time. And it's not just preaching, not just preaching, that I reach out to that person and I seek diligently. I call, no answer. I need to call again, no answer. I send a text, no reply. I need to send that uh, text again. Uh, I, I try to use every means. I contact his friend. Have you heard of so and so? Have you seen so and so? And they contact, they say, Pastor so and so is asking of you. Eventually we'll come together. And he says, okay, first of all, it might even be cold. It might be kind of uh, saying, okay, what do you want? What do you want to tell me? And then I cheer him up. I've just been thinking about you. I've been praying for you. And I hope that this uh, pandemic has not uh, reached your place and has not touched you. It will not touch you. And then I begin to pray for him and uh, for her and, you know, everybody around her. And then she opens up or she lights up. And then she begins to say, actually, Pastor, I didn't know how to contact you, but now this, this, and this. So I said, but you know, God is loving. God doesn't bear any grudge. God will forgive anything, everything we have done. One story paint. And he says, is that all? Don't I have to pay for all the evil things I've done? Or the, I said, no, God is so merciful. He will put all those transgressions, all those iniquities, all the acts of backsliding. He will put them in the depths of the sea. They'll never be remembered against you anymore. He says, I wasn't thinking like that. And then we pray together. And he turns back to the Lord. And he gives his service back to the Lord. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over that one sinner that repents. I pray God will use you. Exactly. That's what Jesus came to do. Look at Luke chapter 19, verse 10. I'm sure you know this. Luke chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 10. What Christ came to do. And what Christ has shown us the example that he did. That's what he wants you to do. That's what he wants you to concentrate on. If you were doing it before, how about today? Because of all the, all the things, activities of life and all the pressures of life that came on you, that came on us, have we slowed down? Have we lessened our commitment? That's what we're saying. We need to renew the love for souls we're going to rescue. Look at what Jesus said. And look at what Jesus did at every opportunity. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save 
that which was lost. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You know, when Jesus saw the multitude, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And because of that, he ministered unto them. He preached the word of the kingdom. And he taught the word of the kingdom. And he gave them the privilege of healing because it's the virtue of the kingdom. And the same thing he wants us to do. He is our master. He is our Lord. And he says the disciple is not above his master. And he that is following after the Lord, a disciple must be like the master. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I want to remind you, it's not just talking about, you know, sinners, total, complete sinners that have never known him. Do you remember Peter? Peter had lost contact with the Lord because he had been careless and he had been overconfident. And he said, even if all men deny you, if they depart from you, I will not deny you. And Jesus said, Peter, this is self-confidence, but before the cock crowed uh, twice, you are going to deny me thrice. He said, no, never. I will never deny you. You know the story? Eventually, it happened. And then Peter became discouraged. He said, he even said, I'm going a fishing. Everything he dropped, the net he dropped before, he went to pick that again. And Jesus went after him. Is there anybody discouraged there? Is there anybody uh, downtrodden there? Is there anybody who has lost his path, has lost his way there? Why don't you reach after them and be like Jesus, reaching out to sinners who never knew him, reaching out to backsliders who knew him and went away, running after people whose, whose love had become cold, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost, as the Lord did uh, to uh, Peter, and he did to many other people, we ought to do as well. Uh, let's read, uh, there's an interesting uh, passage in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, reading from verse 25. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, reading from verse 25. And this is what the Lord is expecting of us. Actually, Paul, who was Saul, he was of Tarsus. And uh, he had gone to Damascus and he met the Lord on the way. And the Lord saved him. His life was turned around. A change came, and eventually he preached the word of God, the gospel, in, in uh, Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. And then eventually when they wanted to kill him, remember he was a new convert, he just came to know the Lord. Eventually he came to Jerusalem. As he came to Jerusalem, the people in Jerusalem will not believe that he had become a real disciple. They thought uh, that's another trick. He wants to come inside us here and he wants to know the key people here and then whisk us into the prison. So Barnabas came and introduced him to the apostles and the apostles eventually received him and so he was going out and coming in before the, you know, it's not just reaching out to sinners. We can reach out to people like Saul. They have come to know the Lord, but they still feel lonely somehow. And they don't feel totally accepted into the fold of the believers. Well, eventually, Paul the Apostle, it was Saul at that time, he went to Tarsus, his own town. And Barnabas had been sent to Antioch to develop the church there, to help the church there, to encourage the church there. And as he got there, then he remembered Saul. Remembered Saul. Do you remember anyone who should be on the field with us? But his back in his own town. Do you remember anyone who should be walking and who should bring all his talent, all his intelligence, everything is God, that he will walk, uh, you know, so like Paul, the apostle later walked. But Saul was not available. And so Barnabas left what he was doing in Antioch. And this love to seek to rescue came within him. And we're told in that verse 25, then departed Barnabas to Tarsus. 
to, for to seek Saul. And he didn't stop until he found him. And the people you're seeking, you will not stop until you find them. You are going to find them. And you are going to link them up, integrate them with the people of God. That's sowing and reaping. Look at what a time he sowed. That's Barnabas. And look at the result. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, we're told, and when he had found him, you will find them. Those who are discouraged, you seek for them and you are going to find them. And those who are totally backsliding, you will seek for them and you will find them. And when you seek for them and you find them, you will not just uh, you know, encourage them and talk to them and smile with them and share with them and leave them where they are. No, they might think, well, I'm, I'm already born again. I know that all the things I did, the Lord has forgiven me. Even if I die now, I know where I will spend eternity, you will not allow them to stop there. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. He brought him unto Antioch. He brought Saul. You know, that was where Paul actually began to develop his ministry and began to develop the outreach. And that Antioch church was where God eventually called Barnabas and Saul for the work I have appointed for them to do. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. A whole year they assembled themselves. It's not just to find them and then to meet them. After one week, I brought you now. I found you and I brought you. You see, the church is available and all the privileges of ministry are available. Barnabas stayed with him. Barnabas kept him for a whole year, we're told, and he taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. I pray that that same mind the Lord will give to every one of us. Look for somebody. Reach out to somebody. Don't allow people to die in discouragement or to be useless in despondency and despair. Reach out to them. Renew your love for souls to rescue. Let's look at James chapter 5, verse 19. James chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 19. He says, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, brethren, ministers, pastors, overseers, if any of you do err from the truth, any of you, I told him, any of you, I, I said it to him, he doesn't, he doesn't hear, he doesn't listen, he doesn't pay attention. And there's no point trying after somebody like that. He's always like that. Any effort you make, it makes your effort useless and redundant. It thinks he knows it all. Brother, don't let's talk like that. That could have been you. That could have been me. That could have been any of us. And the Lord is saying, we should recover the love for the brother. Recover our love for the sister. Recover our love for that son. Recover our love for that daughter. If any of you do err from the truth, what, sh what, are we, what shall we tell them that we have not told them? What should we teach that we have not taught? Did we, did we not want them of the leaven of the Pharisees and the scribes? Did we not want them of the false prophets? Did not, we not want, and now he's gone. They are not listening. If any of you, whatever their fault, if any of you, whatever their reason for backsliding, if any of you, whatever their reason for going astray, brethren, Brethren, brother, sister, leaders, workers, if any of us, any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him, and one convert him, God has put that responsibility in your heart and in my hand that we look for people who have gone away from where they ought to be and we bring them back. Look at verse 20 there. It says, let him know. Let the person who reaches out, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. That's your privilege. And that is how you sow. And that is what you do. So that the love of God through you will bring them back from the fields of wandering where they have been. He says, let him know. Let the soul winner know. 
Let the leader know. Let the pastor know. Let the one that is reaching out in love and is getting them back into the kingdom, let him know that he which combated the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death. Think about that. Shall save his soul from death. Let me ask you, if somebody was sick to the point of death, and you went there, and you prayed a simple prayer, and they come back to life, won't you talk about that? Won't you think about that? Won't you be happy about that? If somebody was uh, at the verge of having an accident, to the point of dying, and you prevented that accident, and he didn't die. How would you feel? You feel so happy, God, you helped me to save a life. But now, look at somebody who is in the danger of the second death, of eternal death, and God has used you to save a soul from death and to hide a multitude of sins. The Lord will use you. The Lord will use me. The Lord will use us together and we will be agents of God's mercy, agents of God's love, agents of God's restoration. The Lord do it for you and through you. The Lord do it through us in Jesus' name. Number one, remember the law of sowing and reaping. Don't ever stop sowing and reaping. Don't ever stop sowing the seed of the word of God and the gospel and the word the Lord himself has given unto us. Don't stop, don't stop. Remember, every time, today, have I done anything? Today, have I sown any seed of the gospel? Today, have I preached the word? Today, have I reached out in love to somebody? Uh, remember, the law of sowing and reaping. If you don't sow, are you going to reap? If you sow sparingly, are you going to reap abundance? If you sow grudgingly, are you going to reap happily? You sow happily, you sow cheerfully, and you sow lovingly, and you sow abundantly, and you sow bountifully, and so will you reap in Jesus' name. Number two, to renew your love. Renew your love. Your love in particular. Renew your love for souls to rescue. Number three, regain the life of sacrificing without relenting. Regain the life of sacrificing without relenting. I don't want you to forget that word sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. You must understand that sacrificial giving must not stop in your life. You see, if we do things only when it's easy for us, when it's uh, comfortable, convenient for us, only when it's uh, the right season uh, and we have the joy and, you know, everything is working out fine. There's no sacrifice in that. But it's when things are difficult. It's when it appears, how can I do this? How can I do this? Do I have the strength? Do I have the energy? Do I have the resources? And yet you keep on doing it. That's when it becomes a sacrifice. And I pray you'll not give up. I said you will not give up. I said you will not give up sacrificially without ever going back and without relenting. You keep on doing what ought to be done in Jesus' name. Regain the life of sacrificing without relenting. We're coming to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, we have received the mercies of God. Mercies in salvation, pass it on. Mercy in sanctification, pass it on. Mercy in compassion, pass it on. Mercy in uh, deliverance, pass it on. Mercy in all that the Lord has given, made us, has given us, pass it on. I beseech you therefore, I plead with you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Present yourself as a living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice. And uh, you know, people would say, if, uh, you know, it comes to be martyred for Christ, I'm ready. 
that's not a living sacrifice. He said, while you're still alive and you keep alive, while you're healthy and you keep healthy, while you're strong and you keep strong, and while you're excited about life, you're still excited about life, and then at that time, when you're on the top of life, while you're living, you present yourself as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, unto God. And that is acceptable and reasonable service. Look at verse 2 there. It says in verse 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. You are renewing your mind every time. You know, a temptation is there. Somebody has fallen into a trap and the temptation is there. He knows better. He shouldn't have done that. Renew your mind. And you sometimes, uh, you know, somebody, he should be contacting you. And there is no contacting you. Well, he knows better. If he needs my help and if he needs my advice, if he needs my encouragement, he'll contact me. He knows better. Renew your mind. Well, somebody, I helped him the other time. And, you know, he went to the other fellow and he was asking, still asking for help. And he didn't say that I had already helped him. And so, even if you help the man, if you help that woman, she's not going to tell anybody you help. Is he going to go about asking for this? and that renew your mind you see we must not go on in the old mind i've done this what more can i do renew your mind it says you want us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that she may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god it tells us in second corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. It says, we shall recollect and we shall remember what the Lord has done for us. And because of that, we should reciprocate. And we should do what the Lord has done for us. Do it for other people. We should be constrained by the love of Christ. We should be propelled by the love of Christ. We should be influenced by the love of Christ. Look at this word. We should be driven by the love of Christ. It says in that verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ compels us. You know, we shouldn't be thinking about the situation around. Can anybody evangelize at such a time like this? Yes, we can. If we're constrained by the love of God, if we're not uh, bogged down, tied down, pinned down by our personal, uh, personal problems, it says, for the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. We die to the things around us. And the love of Christ is the life we want to live now and bring glory unto God. Look at verse 15 there. In verse 15, it says, and that he died for all. Don't forget, he died for you. If you have any problem, a spiritual problem, he died for you. If you have any guilt for anything that shouldn't have happened but happened, he died for you. If you have any pain or condemnation, remember, he died for you. Don't carry the pain of condemnation a minute longer. For he died for all. And he will cleanse you, he'll wash you, he'll show mercy on you, he'll totally erase everything, and then you're on your feet again, and you are serving the Lord because of his substitutionary death for you, and that he died for all that they which live shall not henceforth live unto themselves. He died for you, that's why he saved you, he bore the stripes for you, that's why he healed you. That's why he strengthened you. With that strength that he has given us now, you should not live for yourself. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Died for you and rose again. What's the implication of that? Look at Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And I'm reading from verse 2. Galatians chapter 6, we're looking at verse 2. It says, Bear ye one another's bodies. That the life we live now, I have my own bodies to bear. That sacrifice, sacrifice, bear ye one another's bodies. I see somebody who is, uh, you know, dropping the head and, you know, puts the hand on the, uh, the palm on the chin. Uh, is thinking about something. Uh, 
I have something I'm thinking about you. I have a body I'm carrying to you. I have uh, some challenges I'm facing to you. Bear ye one another's bodies. If, all, if we only can help other people when we don't uh, need anything ourselves, there's no sacrifice in that. But the sacrifice is that we bear one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. When I neglect other people, I'm not fulfilling the law of Christ. When I look away from the needs of other people, I'm not fulfilling the law of Christ. When I only think about myself, I wear all my clothes alone, I eat all my food alone, I, you know, spend all my money alone, and I'm not thinking of the poor, I'm not thinking of the orphans, I'm not thinking of the, the indigent uh, believers, I'm not thinking of those who I need, I, I'm not sacrificing, I'm not fulfilling the law of Christ. But he says, let's wake up. And let's get back into us the very life of Christ and the love of Christ and live in such a way that we're living literally for the happiness of others. We're living for the joy of others. We're li living for the upliftment of others. We're living for the encouragement of others. It's like I'm hungry to encourage somebody. I'm hungry to lift up somebody. I'm hungry to be a blessing to somebody. And I'm so hungry. And if I've not found somebody uh, to help, that hunger is not satisfied. I want to fulfill the law of Christ. That's the life is calling us to, my brother, my sister. That's the life is calling you to. You will fulfill that law of Christ in Jesus' name. Look at that again. Bear ye one another's bodies and so fulfill the law of Christ. I pray the Lord will help you. I said the Lord will help you. You will do it in Jesus' name. I want to touch a sensitive point now. And before I touch that sensitive point, let me read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm looking at verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Look at this. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. That's the sensitive part. Any of us can recollect how we held brother so and so, how we held sister so and so, how we spent everything we've got on teenagers so and so, how we went away, we went out of our way to help somebody. And then when we're expecting a thank you, an act of gratitude, I had. They even gossiped about me. I had, they even said this about me. Look at this world. How is this world like this? How could anybody say something like that? Especially somebody, I went out of my way and I spent and I was spent for them. That's the same thing. You see, the things that happen. The things that Satan does and the things that Satan may make you to hear can turn your mind away from this ministry of the life of sacrificing without relenting. But Paul the Apostle said, I'm still ready and I'm still willing and I'm going to do it cheerfully. I'm going to do it gladly. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Don't, uh, you know, say, you know, I've sown into their lives and they have not, you know, sowed back into me. The reaping will come from heaven. The reaping will come from God. And the Lord will continue to use you. And then the Lord will continue to make you reap abundantly. Don't worry, the Corinthians are not able uh, to reward you abundantly. Christ himself will reward you abundantly. God will reward you abundantly. Life will reward you abundantly. And your reward will be great here on earth and will be great in heaven in Jesus' name. Now, 
You remember uh, what I normally do? I'm going to give you an assignment now. I'm going to read some uh, uh, statements to you. And you will now find references for them by yourself. I, you know, I, I want to get you into doing uh, what I normally do. And instead of fulfilling you today as a leader, I'm going to just say all these things and then you write them down and you will find appropriate references for them yourself. This is it, what you have to remember. As we talk about sowing and reaping, what I'm to remember, as we talk about sowing and reaping, see, consecrate the highest for the most high. Consecrate the highest, the greatest. Everything you've got, all your strength, all your skill, all your energy, all your ability to sow, consecrate the highest for the most high. Oh, offer service from an honest heart. Offer service from an honest heart. Are reproduce disciples for the harvest. The harvest is great. And we cannot do it all alone. Find converts, find believers, and reproduce those disciples for the harvest. Oh, outpour the living water with holy hands. Holy hands. Our hands must not be defiled. Our hands are holy and we're pouring out. And we're pouring out the water of life and the gospel into the lives of people. And not your converts in holiness. Not your converts in holiness. All the converts, as we are nurturing them, as we are nourishing them, as we are making them grow, and you make them grow in the life of holiness. A, abandon the leaven of hypocrisy. Abandon the leaven of hypocrisy. Don't just do it because a regional verse is going to ask you, a set of verse is going to ask you, you're doing it from your heart. And there is no leaven of the Pharisee, which is hypocrisy, in your heart, in anything you're doing. The visage household with healing. Visit households with anointing for healing. Visit households with, um, the, with the virtue of healing. Visit households with the word and the promise and the pronouncement of healing. I invest your resources for heaven. Invest your resources for heaven. Everything God has given you. Here is the time. Here is the opportunity to invest. Invest your resources for heaven. Are reach out to neighbors with hospitality. Reach out to neighbors with hospitality. Maybe you have a time for lunch and you invite your neighbors or for dinner, you invite your neighbors and at this time when everybody is feeling lonely, you invite those neighbors and you reach out to those neighbors with hospitality. You use your talents for God's kingdom without hiding. You remember that a servant in the parable? You gave me only one talent and because it's only, you gave him five, you gave him two, you gave me only one and so I've hidden it and here you have your own. And the Lord said a slothful and unfaithful servant, you'll not hide your talent. Use your talents for God's kingdom without hiding. As spent and be spent for God's honor. Spend and be spent for God's honor. Remember, have the same mind as Christ and follow Paul as he followed Christ. I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. The Lord make the word fruitful in your life profitable in your life and the lord give you the reaping the harvest of everything you are sowing and everything you'll continue to sow in jesus name don't forget remember don't forget renew don't forget regain the life of sacrificing without relenting the lord bless you as we pray now let's rise up together Let's pray to the Lord and let the Lord use everything we have heard to the point now that we are compelled and we are constrained and we are driven by the love of God to go and help people. So, and you will reap. 
So are you already. Tell the Lord, you give your tithes, you give your offering, tell the Lord, you will so abundantly, you will so richly, you will so wholeheartedly, you will so happily, you will so without forgetting. Our God to bring tithes and offering today. No, you won't forget. You remember the law of sowing and reaping. You renew your love seeking after souls. Moses was sought by Aaron. Saul, Paul was sought by Barnabas. You remember Andrew seeking Peter. You remember Philip seeking Nathaniel. And you remember the woman at the well that went back to the town, come see a man that told me all I ever did is not this the Christ. You remember the counselors and the ministers that sought after their king, after Nebuchadnezzar. Don't judge the people, leave all judgments in the hand of God. Don't condemn people, leave condemnation in the hands of the Almighty. Don't take vengeance. Leave that in the hand of the Almighty. Yours is to bring out the love of Christ and be constrained by love and seek the people that will rescue. And remember, to regain the life of sacrifice without looking back, without going back, without minimizing your love, regain the life of sacrifice without relenting. Consecrate what you have to the Most High. Offer your service from an honest heart. Reproduce disciples for the harvest. Reproduce soul winners for the harvest. Witnesses for the harvest. Out for the water of life. Just pour it out. Just pour it out. Not in trickles, as if you're economizing the gospel. Pour it out, pour it out into the lives of people. Nurture converts, follow them up, sow into their lives, sow the seed of knowledge into their lives. In holiness, abandon the leaven of hypocrisy. Visit households. In various ways, you can visit them. SMS, text, whatever. Visit households for the virtue of healing. Invest your resources for heaven. Reach out to your neighbors with hospitality. Use your talents, don't hide your talents. And spend and be spent for God's honor. And for people's benefit. The Lord be with you and make the word that is sown in your heart, your life today, fruitful in every one of our lives. God bless you. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your people, your servants. We thank you for all our leaders, all our brothers, all our sisters. We thank you because we've laid our hands on the plow. We are not going to look back. The strength, the grace, the love, the energy, the passion, the excitement, the enthusiasm to earnestly do it, give to everyone in Jesus' name. For those who are getting discouraged and for those who have any problem oppressing them or, bring, or pressing them down, pressing down on them. We're asking, oh Lord, you take all that discouragement away from everyone in Jesus' name. As we remember the law of sowing and reaping, and we sow and sow and sow again. We pray our reaping will be abundant in Jesus' name. And Lord, as we renew our love for seeking after souls, as we renew our love seeking souls to be saved, to be rescued, we pray you 
you will bless the work and you will bless our service and you will bless our soul winning efforts and many will repent and turn to the Lord in Jesus name and as we regain the life of sacrificing as in the early days when we first knew you as in the early days when we first became workers and leaders in the vineyard of the Lord as we regain the life of sacrificing will not relent anymore will not uh, cool down anymore will not uh, go back anymore we will not allow our love to wash cold anymore oh lord the passion the thirst the enthusiasm the fire that ought to be in us bring it back in jesus name and lord i pray that as your people keep on sowing every day they'll be reaping benefits of your promise and benefits of your power and benefits of your provision in every one of our lives in jesus name i pray lord your people will not miss their reward in faithfulness and they will not miss their reward in fruitfulness they will not miss their reward in everything they're doing faithfully and honestly and cheerfully in jesus name your promise that one will seek for the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all these other things, all these things shall be added unto us. I pray all the addition of blessing, all the multiplication of blessing, all the mountain moving power that uh, you have promised, everything will come to your people in Jesus' name. Your people will not lack any good thing. You know? You'll be their shepherd every time. You'll be their security every time. You'll be their healer every time. You'll be their provider every time. Uh, and you'll provide to meet all their needs and supply. All their needs according to riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, as they bless others, I pray blessings will flow into their lives too. Thank you because I know you have answered. Keep us remembering. Keep us renewing. Keep us regaining the life and the love for sacrificial giving and sacrificial ministry without ever relenting and without looking back. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Please uh, go and do what the Lord has said. If the farmer only had a lecture on how to sow, and then he rejoices the lecture, and he's you know, going over the note of sowing and sowing and sowing and reaping, and he never goes out to sow, there will be no benefit of that lecture. But we'll receive the word of God, go and sow, and great will be the harvest you are going to reap in Jesus' name.